Hello everybody, Samir, engineer, MBA, and investor. And in today's video, I want to talk about Caribou Biosciences DCEO stating some of the facts that I believe you as an investor should be aware about. I'm going to cover all of that in this video. Now, before we do that, before we head into today's video, you guys know the drill. Like this video, smash that like button, destroy that like button. Really does help the channel. If you have not subscribed yet, please consider subscribing. Our community is growing. We talk about CRISPR companies. We talk about biotech companies, genomics. We also talk about other technologies such as Bitcoin and green energy companies like Tesla. So please do subscribe and hit that notification bell for our videos to get you faster. So today's video, I wanted to make something that I, I actually used to do a lot in previous months, but I sort of stopped in the recent weeks, months. But I want to do that, and that is basically playing a video, uh, DCEO Rachel Harris, which you guys know I'm a huge fan of, CEO and founder of Caribou Biosciences. Again, just as a reminder, she founded the company in 2011, Caribou Biosciences, and she was also part of the team that sort of put CRISPR to the light in 2012. So basically in 2011, she founded this company. And 2012, she was part of the team with Jennifer Doudna, that uh, the legendary Jennifer Doudna, that obviously uh, released the legendary papers about CRISPR to where we are today. So huge respect for her. And she sort of mentioned a couple of things I want to talk about navigating today's video. Let's see what we can extract from it. Let's see what we can learn from it. And if you have any comments, you can leave it in the comment section below. Let's play it. Got it. And so I guess given these design differences in the CD19 versus uh, the BCMA program, how should we be thinking about the potential read across from uh, one asset to the other with regards to the platform and other parameters? Yeah, great, great question. So certainly as we look at CB10, initial data will tell us not only about CB10 on its own, but also more generally about the safety and the utility of the PD-1 knockout, which we could end up using in CB12 or, or other future, future product candidates as well. And though the exact edits might differ, a lot of the same themes could likely be important in the solid tumor setting as we think about enhancing persistence for CAR NKs as well. So I do think that what we learn could have pretty uh, broad read through in terms of understanding better decisions to make for some of these other programs as they continue to mature. Got it. And so you talked about the, the rationale for using the, the IPS cell derived NK cells for solid tumors. Can you discuss a little bit more about the, the strategy there and uh, Kind of what gives you the confidence that this is the right approach versus, uh, let's say, some other car, uh, donor drive CAR T strategy or or additional uh, approach that might be uh, relevant for a gene editing platform. Yeah, great, great question. So you know, part of it comes from really understanding the emerging data in the CAR T space, and and really in particular the autologous CAR Ts. Where I think we've we've broadly seen not a lot of efficacy in terms of anti-tumor activity against solid tumors, which obviously is in strong contrast to hematologic malignancies where they've been extraordinarily impactful for patients. So it drove our interest in thinking about how to harness the immune system in a different way. Um, and certainly the natural killer cell biology and, and the fact that it inherently has anti-tumor activity is what really drove us to thinking about CAR and Ks in the first place. Now, obviously, there are a number of different strategies for how to source a natural killer cell, anything from patient-derived cells uh, through to iPSC-derived cells. So that decision was really driven by our belief that several edits will be necessary in order to really fully empower these cells to have appropriate activity and to overcome so many of the challenges inherent in solid tumor targeting. So as you start to add up the number of edits you might want to make, there's certainly a, a ceiling in terms of the maximum number of edits you can make in a primary population of cells. And so that's what really drove us to think about iPSCs, where uh, theoretically you, you have a much higher limit in terms of the total number of edits you can make. And then the ability to actually come in and pick out a single cell clone 
so that by the end of it, you effectively have 100% editing efficiency because you picked a clone that has all the modifications that you're looking for. So part and parcel to that is the differentiation ability. And so that's something that we've spent a few years investing in and have our own protocols here at Caribou for turning iPSCs into natural killer cells with the appropriate biology. Okay. Yeah, so really good points, right? Really good points. I don't know if you guys caught that, but she mentioned 100% efficiency. Their goal is not to go and just improve on the first generation of CRISPR. Their goal is to hit 100% efficiency. No company is doing that right now. CRISPR Therapeutics is not doing that. And TLA is not doing that. No one can reach 100% efficiency. And the fact that Rachel Harwitz here is saying that they want the company to hit 100% efficiency when it comes to IPSCs. And I just think it's just amazing what they're doing. That was one point. The previous question, she did mention that CBO10, which we will get and we are expecting data for phase one in 2022, that phase one 2022 data will also help with other Caribou Biosciences programs, right? Depending on the results, depending on what the data is, depending on what they see, what they can learn from that program, it can also, also allow other programs to be shaped, modified, depending on the edits, depending on what PD-1 knockout, for example, what exact terms they need to do for those programs, depending on what they can learn for CBO10. And to my point here, the point I'm trying to make here is that this company, when you guys look at programs, right? And I know some of you are really numbers, statistics people, data people. What you do is you look at a total, total addressable market of a particular program. And basically you say something along those lines, oh, this program has a potential of $2 billion. Therefore, the company should be worth X, Y, Z. My invitation to you guys is to think of it in a way where this program could unlock other billions through other programs that are also tackling through partnerships, through licensing revenue. Caribou Biosciences is no, no stranger to licensing revenue. But they have so many patents out there. Yes, a lot of them are outside the US, but they still hold a lot of patents in the US, including agriculture and livestock. Keep that in mind, right? Keep that in mind. And these, just as a last point here, maybe as we jump around, Caribou Biosense in their Q3 earnings call, they did announce uh, appointing several board members. And one of the board member comes from Pfizer, right? From the, I think they were a chief patent officer. Chief Pat, Pfizer's chief patent officer, Dr. J Richardson Hiram. Keep that in mind. A, CPO, a chief patent officer, is joining the board of directors in Caribou Biosciences. Keep that in mind, right? Keep that in mind. I'm not starting, starting to insinuate anything. It's just to my point earlier with the fact that I will hold so many patents, so many potential revenues, right? Just keep that in mind. And my last point here is we never really covered this paper. And you guys know early on in this channel, we used to cover a lot of research paper. We sort of stopped doing it. Uh, I will definitely not do it in this video, but just know that, you know, you should expect that in the future videos. Uh, I really want to get back to the science. Uh, you know, I've talked a lot about financials. I've talked a lot about potential. I've talked a lot about the acquisitions market, you know, just Mo Moderna buying, you know, uh, sorry, partnering up with this company, CRISPR company that we mentioned, those types of videos I've made. But I want to get back to the research paper because I feel like science is the root of all. I think CRISPR is science. CRISPR is driven by science. It's a new era of science where we start the war on cancers, where we relieve people from for the first time ever from diseases that can potentially end their lives. You know, these are subs these are off off um, off consequences as well. Like there's there's secondhand consequences consequences such as communities, families being destroyed, and you know. CRISPR does exactly that to eliminate all of that through technology. CRISPR therapeutics, for example, have already cured over 50 patients. And that's what Caribou Biosciences are trying to do with CBO10, which we will get in 2022 data. But, you know, they released a paper in, in, in the early part of September. Confirmational control of Cas9 by CRISPR hybrid RNA DNA guides mitigates off-target activity in T-cells. 
Chardonnay's RDNA improves Cas9 specificity while preserving on-target editing efficiency. 2-deoxynucleotide two position affects guide specificity in target-dependent manner. Chardonnay's RDNA causes distorted guide target R DNA duplex geometry and R loop destabilization. And the final highlight is Chardonnay's RDNA slows Cas9 cleavage rate and promotes dissociation of off-target substrate. So just a couple of highlights there. I don't really have access to this paper. Unfortunately, I have to pay. I'm not going to do that to go through that. You guys know I'm a huge, huge, huge bull of um, research paper being decentralized, but that's another topic for another day. I just don't like how they want us to pay for data that should improve humanity forward, right? But, you know, it is what it is. Business is going to do business, right? So people are going to squeeze every single penny out of you. Uh, and that should give you an indication as to what the priorities of people are. But uh, but anyways, I'll also say that, you know, Caribou Biosciences did publish this paper. Data is looking good. But again, all eyes are on CBO10, just like what the CEO Harvest just mentioned in this video. All data on in 2022 for CBO10 will define the future of this company. We will leave it off like this. Hopefully, you guys are having a beautiful weekend. It is Saturday. Thank you so much for watching this video. Like this video. Smash that like button. Subscribe if you haven't. Hit that notification bell. And if you have any comments, input about Caribou Biosciences, about CBO10, about this research paper, about the appointment of the Pfizer CPO in their board of directors, let me know in the comments below. Curious to see what you guys think. Thank you so much for watching and have a beautiful Saturday. Thank you.